So first of all, let me say thank you very much to the Cancer Council Australia for the invitation to come and speak to you. Um, it's a very interesting opportunity to try and share some of the work that we've been doing in Europe and in the UK to try and uh, kickstart things in terms of uh, uh, a new approach to occupational cancer. I'll start off with some general introductory remarks about cancer and the importance of that. I'll talk about uh, work that we've been doing to try and benchmark the, uh, the, the, the burden of cancer in terms of a uh, number of deaths and other uh, impacts, uh, both in the UK and in Europe. And some of the figures that I'll show you will uh, echo the things that Terry uh, presented already. Uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, legislation and how you might uh, approach things to try and regulate in terms of occupational cancer, um, but other things as well. And you know, I, I want to mainline on some of the other initiatives that are going on in the UK in terms of trying to improve people's understanding of the, of the problem. Um, I'll talk a little bit about work that we've done also in terms of uh, temporal trends and, and exposure, and I think this is one of the important uh, things that we need to actually uh, get involved with and understand because it really eases our job in terms of trying to reduce risks in the future. And then I'll talk about some of the simple interventions that we might think about in terms of trying to provide solutions. Uh, before I start then, I, I, just one minor correction to what Terry said. I used to be research director at IOM, but I stepped down from that role at the end of last year. Uh, and I work now uh, between IOM and Harriet Watt University. You, you probably understand what a university is, but you may not understand what the Institute of Occupational Medicine is. Um, so I thought I would explain a little bit about it. Um, we're a, a not-for-profit company which was originally set up by the coal company in the UK to carry out research into co-workers pneumoconiosis. And so we've got a, a long background in terms of working in industry looking at uh, disease. Uh, we no longer do very much work for the coal industry in the UK, but we cover a wide variety of uh, research and consulting interests, uh, both in the UK and, and elsewhere. Um, we do a lot of work. I mean, th thousands and thousands of pieces of work each year. And so some of that involves uh, occupational cancer. And uh, in particular, a lot of the research that we've been doing at IOM has been focused on uh, cancer over the years. Cancer is clearly a very big public health priority, and it's a, it's a bigger problem uh, both in uh, uh, Australia as it is in, in the UK. We share a lot, common heritage and so on, uh, but you have a lot more land than we do. When I threw the slide, I tried to get it to scale, but I felt if it went truly to scale, the UK might just disappear completely off the uh, radar. But we've got a lot more people. And so, you know, in terms of the number of uh, cases of cancer diagnosed each year, we, uh, we have a, a lot uh, more uh, individuals affected. But in general, the, the, the rate of cancer uh, is similar in both countries. And uh, uh, survival, well, survival is, is better in Australia. You have a better regime of, uh, of identifying cancers and treating cancers than we do in the UK. And so, for example, uh, in terms of cancer survival, two-thirds will survive uh, uh, to uh, more than five years, whereas it's really just uh, uh, about a half in, in the UK. There's a wide variety of uh, cancers that are, are caused, but I, I want to focus on lung cancer because lung cancer uh, or respiratory cancers, as we'll see, make up a big part of what the priority is in terms of occupational cancer. So about 13% in the UK uh, of all cancers diagnosed are lung cancers, uh, but when it comes to look at the mortality, uh, the proportion of uh, deaths from cancer is much bigger. And that reflects the fact that only about 10% of people who ever get a diagnosis of lung cancer will survive more than five years. Uh, so our treatment regimes, while they're very good, and, and uh, as we said in Australia, uh, more than half uh, people who get that diagnosis will survive, it's still uh, very much a death sentence for many people if they get a diagnosis of uh, respiratory cancer. Again, you'll see later in the presentation, many of the occupational cancers are respiratory cancers. So both uh, from exposure to asbestos, but for many other uh, uh, causes as well. And that really underlines for me the, the message that prevention is a very important thing that we need to focus on in terms of occupational cancer because we can't rely on the, uh, the treatment aspects to, uh, to kind of bail us out and, and, and uh, 
Uh, and so, you know, making sure that we have good, healthy work environments for individuals is, is key. I mentioned there's already been made about the uh, World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer. And IARC has had a, a monograph program in place since 1972 where they review the evidence that's available, scientific evidence that's available about the uh, cancer hazards that may exist. And they categorize uh, agents in terms of a uh, number of groups, group one being uh, carcinogenic to humans, 2A being probably carcinogenic, and we heard already that glyphosate uh, has been recently put into that uh, category. And then there are a number of other categories, uh, 2B and so on. It's, it's interesting to look at the rate at which we've been identifying cancer. So these are the uh, proven human carcinogens mapped out in the period since 1972 uh, up to date. And we have uh, 116 agents or circumstances which have been classified in this way over the years, roughly three per year on average. But the important thing to realize is that there's no sign of this uh, trend decreasing. It's just a simple linear trend. And the suggestion, to my mind, is that if we carry on looking, then we'll carry on identifying things which cause cancer. And if you think about the number of agents which are in 2B, uh, 2A sorry, category, which is probably carcinogenic, then there's another 73 there. If you look at 2B, which are possibly carcinogenic, there's nearly 300. So there's a, a huge number of things out there which are either known or probably or possibly uh, uh, carcinogenic agents. And th this for me is one of the, the problems that we have in terms of trying to prioritize things, that we really need to think amongst all these various things, where should we take action? How should we uh, address these individual problems? And one of the ways to do that is to move beyond hazard, but to think about impact. And the, one of the first attempts to try and assess impact uh, was carried out by uh, two uh, rather famous epidemiologists, Richard Dahl and Richard Pito, uh, who, who really carried out work for the American government to try and say how much of uh, cancer could be prevented if we were able to, uh, to design the right type of interventions. Now, this work was done in 1981. And it was really part and parcel of what was you know, one of the early attempts to try and address cancer. It was part of what uh, became known as Richard Nixon's war on cancer. Well, what they identified was that uh, for a whole range of possible exposures that there were uh, perhaps more or less important things. So diet, they said, uh, they thought was perhaps uh, most important. Tobacco next, infections, reproductive risks, and then... Number five, occupation, uh, where they thought that, well, perhaps it was about 4% of all cancers might be due to workplace exposures, and they set some sort of uncertainty bounds on that, which uh, uh, said, well, it could be as low as 2%, could be as high as 8%, but they're not, uh, not quite sure. Now, since then, uh, a, a lot has been done to try and improve our understanding of what uh, causes of cancer uh, may be important. And if you were to redraw this uh, graph nowadays, it would be different. There would be less emphasis on diet. Uh, tobacco would be number one, uh, and some of the other things would uh, disappear. So, uh, for example, uh, medical uh, exposures nowadays uh, account for very few uh, potential cancers. And it was uh, as part of that realization that things had moved on that the UK Health and Safety Executive commissioned an updating of the, uh, the cancer burden estimates for workplace exposures in, in UK. And this work uh, really was uh, tempted to be completely comprehensive, to try and to uh, uh, assess all the various possible uh, sources of cancer that might be uh, present in the workplace and to identify all the possible types of cancers that, that may be caused. And we focused on uh, those agents which were identified by IARC as either proven uh, human carcinogens, group one, or probable human carcinogens, which were group 2A. Uh, so we didn't include a lot of things that are possibly uh, carcinogenic. The results of this uh, showed that uh, in terms of the relative proportion of, uh, of disease for each of the different types of cancers, which, which known as the attributable fraction, then mesothelioma, we thought, was almost always caused in men by work, and in women, slightly less. So it's something like about 80% of, uh, 
of cases in women we thought were uh, work-related, the remainder being due to para occupational or environmental exposures. Uh, next on the list was cyanonasal cancer uh, and then lung cancer. Lung cancer in men we thought might uh, explain one in five of uh, cancers and that, that actually has generated a bit of kickback from people who look at it and they say, well, how can this be? You know, we, we surely we know that cigarette smoking is the main cause of, uh, of uh, lung cancer. But you have to accept that workplace and cigarette smoking may be interacting with each other and so there may be this possibility that the risk is bigger uh, amongst smokers and that the occupational exposures add to the risks that the, uh, the smokers experience. And then there's a whole host of other cancers that we've identified. But when we did our assessment, we, uh, I think somewhat to our surprise, came to the conclusion that about 5% of all cancers were work-related. And if you remember back in the 1980s, that was roughly what uh, Doll and Pito thought uh, was the situation as well. So although we've made great strides in terms of protecting people in certain industries and we've changed, the industry has changed without recognition over that period of time, still we're faced with a similar uh, level of uh, disease burden, that the, the changes we've made haven't really had the impact that we would have hoped for. And one of the things that motivates me is I don't want to be sitting in the audience in 10 or 20 years' time and somebody stand up and say, you know, we've done an assessment of the occupational cancer burden and it's 5%. You know, it, it, these are all preventable cancers. These are all cancers which there's no need for them to occur if we get things right in our workplaces. If you look at the causal agents then, uh, the, the uh, studies that we've done have shown asbestos is the main cause of, uh, of cancer um, registrations and, and main cause of cancer deaths both mesothelioma and uh, uh, asbestos-related lung cancers. Second on our list is shift work involving uh, night work, uh, which uh, has been categorized by IARC as a, a category 2A carcinogen in terms of uh, breast cancer in women. And then mineral oils, solar radiation, silica, diesel engine exhaust, PAHs, working as a painter and so on. The, the one thing that, that often uh, comes back when I, I show this is, uh, you know, people wonder where the chemicals are. You know, there's this, this vision that it's, it's lots of chemicals that are causing the, uh, the burden of disease that we've got, but that's not the case. Um, in fact, 85% of the, the, uh, the cancer cases that we identify come from just 10 can carcinogens, and most of these carcinogens are associated with, well, things like construction. Half of the cases that we uh, have benchmarked uh, will come from uh, the construction industry in the UK. Now, th th this I think is an important sort of checkpoint for us because remember we've got 116 uh, category uh, one carcinogens from IARC and we've got uh, more than 300 other possible or probable carcinogens. But if you focus and you just look at the top 10 chemical agents, then that will cover most of the cases of uh, occupational cancer that are diagnosed. So one of the important outputs of, uh, of this work has been to allow us to prioritize action, to try and say where we could have the most benefit. Now, in terms of uh, protecting people's health, we often think that legislation is the, uh, the key way to, to do this, and in Europe uh, we have a a pan-European system of regulating health and safety where uh, the uh, uh, European Union sets the agenda and then each country implements the, uh, the, the legislation in its own situation. We have a carcinogens and mutagens directive which uh, has uh, done that in Europe and it was first introduced in 1990. But, you know, it's a very cumbersome system. You know, that uh, to do this in a, in a way that actually has any effect is very difficult. So over that period since 1990, we've really only had one substantive amendment to the, uh, the directive, which was to revise the binding limit for benzene exposure. We, we only have three exposure limits within the directive in terms of binding limits. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we really don't have uh, legislation which is, well, in my view, is fit for purpose. And... Actually, in the Commission's view, is also not fit for purpose either. And in 2004, they started a process by which they wanted to update the, uh, the legislation. 
It may surprise you to know that uh, we still, in 2015, haven't updated the, uh, the legislation. And the whole process has become mired in, uh, well, in really process and discussions and politics. And that's really uh, a big problem for us. In 2012, uh, because the legal requirements of the Commission are that they have to have an impact assessment, we carried out an impact uh, assessment for them in relation to 25 carcinogenic agents. And we uh, showed them that uh, there was benefit in terms of reducing uh, limit values for many of these agents, but not all. And we, in fact, recommended a prioritization to them as well. But my argument is that uh, the legislation we have in Europe hasn't worked. We still have a, a tributal fraction of cancer, which is around 5%. Um, the carcinogens and mutagens directive doesn't cover many of the main causes of uh, occupational cancer. For example, it doesn't cover crystalline silica, doesn't cover shift working, uh, and so on. So it, it's not really focused on the problem. It's focused on chemicals, and uh, that's not really... Um, perhaps what, what it should be. And it, it truly is focused on chemicals and not things like diesel engine exhaust and crystalline silica where there's uh, perhaps a bigger need to have uh, uh, some, uh, some legislation. Well, in, in any case, legislation doesn't seem to uh, be something that's easy to update. And uh, as we've seen, uh, things are, are really uh, reaching a very perilous uh, position. Um, and then finally, uh, for legislation to be effective, it has to be uh, taken up by uh, people in the workplace. And uh, as part of uh, some recent work I've been doing with the safety and health professionals in uh, the UK, uh, we carried out a survey of uh, the members to ask them about their understanding of occupational cancer risks. And we got the most ill-informed response back um, because they, they really haven't been focused on this as a problem. They, they, their focus is mainly on safety issues and not so much on health. People now in Europe are getting to the stage of saying, well, you know, something has to happen uh, to, uh, to improve the situation. And uh, on workers, uh, International Workers Memorial Day uh, recently, the European Trade Unions uh, Confederation uh, put out uh, some publicity saying that this was completely unacceptable and that you know, the, uh, the Commission and governments really needed to get their act together and, uh, and take, uh, take steps. Well, one of the, uh, the reasons, I think, why uh, this process is, is rather uh, laboured is uh, it comes out from actually the impact assessment work that we did. Um, the, the graph that you can see um, shows... On the horizontal axis, the baseline health uh, costs in uh, millions of euros, and on the vertical axis, the number of cancer deaths that uh, we predicted occurring between 2010 and 2069 in Europe. And you can see that uh, the, the, in the top right-hand corner of the graph, there are two rather outlying uh, uh, lines. They are for diesel engine exhaust and respirable crystalline silica. And there we uh, estimate that there will be more than 100,000 deaths in each case uh, from lung cancer occurring from these exposures in Europe over the next 50 years. And the cost, the health costs associated with that uh, uh, mortality is something in the order of 100 billion euros or more over that period of time. It's an enormous cost. You know, it's, it's a... It's a it's a measurable fraction of the GDP of Europe over that period of time. It's not insignificant. And so recognizing the fact that these are the health costs monetized, but actually in our burden estimation, we also looked at the costs of preventing these by implementing control measures. And to put cost against these, uh, you end up with figures which are even larger. Um, so in, in essence, what we found was that there isn't a cost benefit in the way that these things are done in actually intervening. Now, my problem with cost benefit analysis is that it's uh, slanted against action. It's a political tool which is designed to uh, allow you to judge investments today. But what they do is they discount benefits which occur in the future. So they say if we spend money today to prevent health, 
but those benefits don't accrue for another 40, 50 years, then the benefits shouldn't really count for very much. And so we downplay completely the health costs uh, in that process. And we argued that with the Commission and said that you shouldn't take this uh, as seriously as, as it maybe implies, and you should focus perhaps on the human toll rather than on the financial costs. And they were, to be fair, they, uh, they were uh, listening to that as, a, as an argument. But I must admit I've given up rather on uh, regulators and politicians in terms of getting action. And we have, uh, for a while, been saying to professionals in, uh, in the UK that really, if, if we're going to get something done, then we, as the professionals, need to take ownership of this problem and try to persuade our employers, to try and persuade trade unions to, uh, to do something. So I'm really delighted that uh, the uh, Institute of Occupational, uh, Institution of Occupational Health and Safety, IOSH, and the uh, British Occupational Hygiene Society have both started campaigns to try and address uh, cancer and the uh, uh, other problems that are associated with uh, workplace exposures. So the, the main focus of these uh, campaigns is really to raise awareness, and as I said also, uh, awareness of the problem is quite abysmal amongst the professionals. But they've done this in a very sensitive way. That they've looked at the evidence that was available and they've decided to, uh, to prioritise their action, not to try and address everything, but to say, let's focus. So both campaigns will uh, be concerned with the construction sector, where we think that the majority of the, uh, the problem lies, and they will deal with a number of carcinogenic agents or other exposures in the, the workplace. In fact, the, the No Time to Lose campaign, and I've got some of the materials which uh, you can have a look at or take away um, from these campaigns. Um, the, the No Time to Lose campaign will focus on uh, just five carcinogenic agents, diesel engine exhaust particulate, solar radiation, crystalline silica, shift work involving night work and asbestos. And the program is uh, set to run over a two-year period and it will progressively uh, cover these top five uh, agents as, as we go. This, this is a, an important first step, I think, to get people to, uh, to recognise the problem. And as, uh, as part of the, uh, the whole program, then, they've set an action plan, uh, to, uh, challenge government to try and highlight the, uh, the cost to society, to, uh, to improve the intelligence network that we have in terms of exposures in the workplace and to uh, fund more research. And they've also challenged the regulator to uh, get more uh, efficient in the, uh, the process. Um, and an action plan uh, challenging uh, the professionals and the industry as well. Uh, very much they're trying to uh, get industry to sign up to this. So they, they're asking industry representatives to sort of take a pledge, a public declaration that they are going to implement some form of uh, program. Okay, so th there is a challenge here as to what's to be done. There is some good news as well that uh, comes out of the, uh, the research that we've been doing. And the, the good news is that we can do something about this problem. It's not an intractable problem. Uh, back in the 1970s, we identified that exposure to vinyl chloride monomers, the, uh, the building blocks of uh, PVC, uh, caused a, a rather rare liver tumour. And uh, industry and, and, uh, and governments really were quite shocked and startled at the time. And I, I remember having a conversation with uh, one of the people who was in the production side of the process at, th at this time, and he said that ICI, which was then one of the biggest producers of PVC in Europe, uh, had decided that they, if, if they didn't solve the problem, they would close down all their PVC plants and they would just retrench from the industry. Um, so it was clearly seen as a, a major problem. But as you can see, over a period of just over a year, the industry was able to drop the exposure to vinyl chloride by uh, more than an order of magnitude. And that's, that's a pretty impressive uh, uh, achievement. And how were they able to do that? Well, actually, all they did was accelerate technological changes that uh, were in place. So they'd already been working on cleaning systems inside the reactor vessels using high-pressure water, high water jets. And so they just accelerated that research uh, uh, implementation. They carried out other technical improvements, improved the ventilation, uh, uh, paid attention to uh, leaks in the process and plant, and then provided workers with uh, breathing apparatus when it was appropriate. I mean, th th these are sort of standard uh, 
approaches in terms of occupational hygiene practice. Uh, nothing special was being done. They didn't completely redesign the process. They retrofitted changes uh, and solved the problem virtually overnight. Now, looking at similar data for a whole host of other industries uh, from a review that we carried out in 2007, you can see these are uh, fitted lines, but in general, over time, the exposure seems to go down. And what we see is that on average, there's about a 5 to 10% reduction in exposure year on year as uh, time progresses. And out of all these uh, studies that we reviewed for aerosols, there was only one study which showed an increase in exposure over time. And we did the same for gases and vapors and for fibrous dusts, and the pattern is remarkably similar for all of these different types of agents. And that suggests, I mean, you know, science is a wonderful thing, but occupational health science is, uh, is, and occupational exposure science is, is not an exact science. So to find such an almost universal truth implies that there's something very uh, important behind it. And for me, the thing that's uh, behind it is uh, the capitalist process. It's about if you want to be in business, you've got to improve your process. You've got to continuously be trying to uh, improve the way you do things to get uh, financial benefit out of things. And it, as a side benefit to that, we uh, end up seeing exposures going down. And uh, it's, it's a, a very useful side benefit because we don't have to do anything to get that benefit. That just happens in most industries. So we could do something to just tweak that a little bit to try and encourage a little bit better performance. And if we could do that, that would be a major achievement. Instead of getting 5 to 10% reduction every year, if you get 10 to 20% reduction, which wouldn't require a lot of extra effort, that, that would be a major achievement. So the kinds of interventions that we uh, can conceive of to try and work towards a solution would be things that would just to uh, improve the technology a little bit better you know, to, for example, for diesel, to look at the fuel formulations, could we get a better fuel formulation that gave uh, less uh, emission of diesel particulates? Um, or simple uh, solutions like providing local exhaust ventilation uh, or providing appropriate personal protective equipment. The hygienists have this kind of, uh, you know, unremitting mantra which says, you know, personal protective equipment, the last resort. Um, but actually, you know, it's more dogma than truth. And... Uh, if you look at the things realistically, personal protective equipment is a very effective way of controlling uh, exposures and is something that nowadays is much more acceptable to workers than it was 20, 30 years ago when the dogma was, uh, was at its height. Of course, these are the ways that you uh, try to uh, intervene, but uh, if you're a legislator, then the kind of interventions that you perceive of are more about compliance with the law or tightening up exposure limits. And I've got a little example that... Uh, might bring things home to you in terms of the benefits of, of these kind of approaches uh, as we go. This is for crystalline silica, and it really looks at, for the UK, um, the benefits of moving from where we were, are, which was having a limit value of 0.1 milligram per cubic meter and very poor, poor compliance with the law. Only about a third of workplaces complied with this limit value. And the options that we investigated were introducing new limit values at lower figures, half or a quarter of the existing limit, or just improving the compliance, moving uh, to 90% uh, compliance. Uh, so rather busy graph, and I'll go through it step by step, but basically the red bars are to do with the baseline, so that's 0.1 and 33%. The orange uh, lower limit uh, value, but still poor compliance, the next one is even lower limit, but still poor compliance. And then we step through uh, with uh, the original limit again, but better compliance, then lower limit, better compliance, and, uh, and so on. And we just if we move on to the next slide, it'll be a, bit, a little bit clearer. So these uh, bars are just the ones that are colored in now that are to do with uh, reducing the limit value. And the first thing to note is that if we do nothing, that's just the red bars, um, then the number of registrations uh, from exposure to crystalline silica stays broadly the same, somewhere around about 800 uh, cases of cancer every year occurring in the UK because of these exposures. But if we 
were to reduce the limit, then we get some benefit. So by uh, 2080, we can get down to almost half the number of cases in this, uh, in this projection. That, that would be something uh, beneficial. But the real benefit comes actually if you improve compliance. So the next set of bars show you the situation where we've got 90% compliance with the law in the UK and either the original figure or um, the lower exposure limits. And here you can see that if we get 90% uh, compliance with the law, then we could get down to uh, 100 registrations over the period of time that we're looking at. And if we could do that with a lower limit, we could almost eliminate the problem of uh, occupational cancer for, uh, from uh, silica exposure. Uh, it will take some time because uh, there's a long lag between intervening and actually seeing the benefit. But that's something that we need to be aware of, that uh, we need to invest in this, uh, this whole area for the future. So the solutions that are available are very simple. You don't have to look very far to find uh, solutions. So you know, there are websites, there are guidance documents, there are uh, uh, best practice documents available that tell you how you should deal with uh, exposures to crystalline silica, diesel engine exhaust, and so on. Um, and some of these, uh, the, the, these are uh, figures taken from uh, uh, the uh, OSHA website and the uh, NASH website in the USA, uh, where you can see on the uh, left-hand side the, uh, the situation with no control while they're doing this uh, cutting with a, a power tool uh, and uh, the situation with just local exhaust ventilation on the tool. It drops the exposure during this uh, work by a factor of 100. Now, why don't people do this? You know, if, if, if I had to do this at home, hey, I'd be going for the situation on the right-hand side rather than the left-hand side. Um, but people don't do it because it costs a little bit more. If you're a construction uh, company, you either have to buy the equipment or you rent it, and the cost will be slightly more. It won't be a lot more, but it'll be slightly more to, uh, to buy the better uh, tools. And... and uh, harsh financial environment, people often choose the lower cost situation. So we've got to try and, it's, it's not about the technology. The technology exists. It's about shifting people's mindset to say, what we've been doing over the years is not good enough. We need to do something which is, is better. And we need to think more about respiratory protective equipment as a possible means of controlling exposure. And th this, this is something we need to think about for diesel engine exhaust, where you know, there are many people who are not in conventional workplaces who are exposed to diesel engine exhaust, and we need to think about how we could provide adequate protection for them. And in many cases, that will be respiratory protection. You know, we, we need to think, is it acceptable, is it going to be acceptable for us to issue our traffic cops or our uh, other uh, uh, workers in the, uh, the public sphere with respiratory protection? to try and uh, uh, reduce their risks. I'm not advocating it. I'm challenging you to think about it. So my main message is that the status quo isn't good enough, that we cannot carry on as we are doing. If we do that, then we will end up with, in 20, 30, 40 years' time, 5% of all cancers being due to workplace exposures, or maybe worse. Who knows? Um, we need to do something to try and address the problem. But the, the, the whole thing is that it's not difficult to do. We just need to accelerate this uh, natural process of improving things in the workplace to get the exposures down a little bit faster than they are at the moment. And the tools to do that are there. They're not new. We don't have to invent new things. We just have to use our ingenuity to apply existing kinds of controls, but apply them in situations where in the past we wouldn't really have thought that that was necessary. It's all about changing people's mindsets. It's all about telling them, if you don't do something, then hundreds of thousands of people are going to lose their lives. But if you do a little bit, you can go a long way to preventing these deaths. So my uh, conclusions then are that we need to do something better in terms of understanding the problem. And in fact, you know, the, the work that we have done has been done by almost pulling things out of uh, you know, the sort of atmosphere. You know, the, the, the evidence is slim and it puts together to be a coherent picture, but it's not 
as robust as it could be. We need to have better information systems uh, available to us. Legislation is necessary. I'm not advocating we do away with the legislation, but I'm saying it's not sufficient to solve the problem. We need to do more. And we can do this by building coalitions to uh, get safety professionals, occupational health professionals, uh, trade unions, management, workers, industry organizations to come together in a communal way to try and focus on dealing with the problem. As time goes on, um, occupational exposures go down, and that's, that's really a very important point. It's not that we'll be pushing against a, uh, a trend. We just need to try and accelerate that trend. It's going to ring? Yes? <laughs> no time to lose. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, John. That's fabulous because that means it gives us some time for some questions and we've actually got a good chunk of time for that, which is uh, a very good piece of news. Um, I want to call for questions from the floor. Oh, there's one down there. All right. Far away. Uh, why does shift work of any job present a higher risk than day shift work? Um, I, I, you know, I think the answer is we don't really properly understand it. That uh, the, the, the epidemiological evidence suggests that for women who work night shifts, there's an increased risk of breast cancer. And the hypothesis is that this may be uh, somehow hormonally related. If you work on night shifts, clearly it, it disrupts your normal uh, biological rhythms. And so it will disrupt the hormone system as well. Breast cancer is a hormonally mediated uh, cancer. So you, know, you can see there's a plausible argument that says you know, it's something to do with the biology uh, uh, of the process. But, but breast cancer, again, it, it surprises a lot of people that you know, breast cancer pops up as such a high priority in, in the rankings here. Um, and it, it surprised the IOSH uh, to the point where they said, well, you know, it's really something we need to get more people aware of. And so they put it into their uh, five priority areas for, uh, for the campaign. Thanks very much, John. That was uh, really tremendous. Uh, my name is Peggy Trump. I'm an occupational uh, hygienist and uh, I particularly work and am interested in the construction industry. Um, I was interested to hear your comments about uh, well, exposure um, uh, uh, reductions, of course, in terms of silica exposure, which I totally agree with. Um, but in my experience here, even at the very top level companies, which are the ones I mainly work with, um, you'd never see a, a, a hygienist around to, to do any measurements. Um, one has just uh, recently employed a hygienist, but that was because of a whole set of peculiar circumstances and mainly at my instigation. Um, so I'm just interested in Europe. Is, is it more common for um, uh, measurements to be able to be taken so that you can actually get a picture uh, of what's going on there? Um, I would say in general not. I think we, um, as I said at the beginning, we share a lot. And we sh you know, one of the things we share is a, a lack of, uh, of hygiene uh, resource. But very interestingly, for crystalline silica, um, in Europe there is a... Uh, a social partnership on crystalline silica, and it's uh, formally been set up under the European Commission's umbrella. And the purpose of this uh, uh, program is really to get uh, labor unions and employers in the same place and to agree some sort of priorities for this. And as part of that, the, uh, the employers have agreed to measure exposure regularly in the workplaces. So there's a commitment in each workplace to measure exposure each year and in addition to that, to offer health surveillance to the, uh, the workforce. And so that's been a major step forward. And uh, what it's actually allowed the industry to demonstrate is that they see the, the kind of temporal trends that I've been, uh, been talking about, that exposures in, in the industry have been falling over the, the five or so years that the program has been in place. Um, so I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of the fact that if you measure exposure, it will help you understand whether or not you are seeing a, a real improvement and it will let you allow, allow you to see the, the, the rate of improvement. But you don't need to do that on a, on a sort of employer by employer basis and keep the information secret. If you're gonna have benefit from this, you have to do it on an industry wide basis and share the information. There's just enough time for a microphone to land over there. 
Uh, I'm Susan Tepe. I'm the Associate Professor of Occupational Health and Safety at RMIT University. And we have grappled with how you teach all these things for a very long time, but I'll just make a couple observations. Um, one of the things that you were saying was that, um, you know, the, the issue that I'm concerned about is that your statistics at the beginning are all about the outcomes, the things that people were able to be compensated for, and all of our focus is on numbers of these um, incidences and their outcomes. But the things that you talk about in terms of making progress are about measuring exposure. And so there's no legislation in Australia that strongly encourages assessment of exposure. There's a move toward doing it if you're a good person, but there, you know, the focus is still very much on the outcome. So until we can actually get some focus further upstream, it'll never happen. And that's very similar to my previous comment, or my other comment, is that you were very concerned about um, there being just a natural reduction in um, exposures. To me, that's just a really strong reminder that OHS professionals have to get in at that design phase and working with industries and organizations to make sure you get a voice at the table at that point. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I, I agree with everything you said. Um, you know, I, w occupational health and safety professionals need to challenge themselves because I think there's a lot of complacency almost in the way that we, we deal with things. You know, we, we do need to strive for things to be a lot better than they are today. And that means doing things very differently from, from today. And so we need to think, okay, you know, as I said about respiratory protection, we need to challenge ourselves. You know, is the dogma that we've had all these years the right thing to be saying? Or should we be saying, no, no, respirators are actually very useful and we should be using them more? Debbie Glass, Monash University. I wanted to reflect a little bit about how we get better compliance because you suggest that that's one way in which we're really going to reduce the burden. And yet, uh, my experience is that small and medium sized enterprises, of which employ a very large number of people, have um, a vanishingly small knowledge of exposure limits and control measures. Um, so, given that they don't know about it, they're not going to comply with the limits. The only way we're going to get compliance is by having some effective enforcement, I would suggest. Do you have any other ideas? Uh, well, I agree. You know, we, we need to have somebody uh, promoting change, and that might be the regulator, but it could equally be you know, the industry itself taking ownership of the problem. Um, and for small companies, they don't need to know my exposure is this and I need to be there. What they need to know is that to do this job, I need to use this kind of equipment. And, you know, to do the, you know, I, I was quite struck, you know, and I was in the UK uh, uh, in the city centre and uh, there were these guys cutting up paving stones, you know, and, and in the past, you know, you would see clouds and clouds of dust. But actually there was nothing like that. It was very noisy still. But... Uh, there was no dust, and I, I kind of looked more carefully to see what was going on. And there were two of them there, and the one guy was cutting, and the other one was spraying water onto the uh, the saw. And you know that's a very simple change, and and that change has taken place because someone has said to them, "You can't do it the way you did it before. You need to do it like this." It's either in the specification or some other. So you can make changes by you know improving practice. Uh, in a direct way like that. John, if I can exercise Chairman's privilege and ask a question myself, and that is I was fascinated by your five top priorities, and I'm sure there was lots of debate about what was in and what was out, and I suspect you were involved in that. So I've got a two-pronged question. One is diesel exhaust was in. Yep. Um, clearly there's been changes in terms of the formulation of diesel, and those things are coming in progressively over time, so that's clearly going to help over the longer term. What other strategies are you recommending with regard to diesel? And the second prong question is, what are the things that you maybe think should have been in there, or do you think there's anything else that might go close to joining that list of five? Uh, so I wasn't involved in the, the choice of oh, okay. the five, but uh, you know, I, I don't disagree with the choices that they, uh, they made. Um, 
I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of ways you can spin things if you want, and there are you know, several other priorities that, that could be there uh, in terms of uh, you know, other risks in, in the workplace. So PHs, for example, would be a, another possibility. Wood dust might be another priority. Um, and they made their choices for various uh, reasons. Um, so if we, your first point was? Yeah, and, and the practical management for diesel. Oh yeah, that's a that's a big challenge. Respirators, I think, have a, a role to play, and uh, you know, respirators are very efficient uh, ways of protecting people, and they are flexible. So that's one, and, and you know, especially if you've got workers who are like uh, postmen or you know other other people who are very sort of widely uh, dispersed, if you like, in terms of, of where they get exposed. Um, that that's a possibility. And there's a lot of other simple things. You know, it, it, it strikes me that if you were uh, had more efficient filtration into cabs, um, that that would be one uh, possible way of uh, improving the situation. And so, you know, it's simple things like that can, if we can get people to start thinking, well, you know, if I buy a truck, that I need to make sure it's got the right kind of uh, air handling system into the the cab to uh, uh, ensure that people get some some protection. One down the front here, which might have to be the last one. This is just coming with the microphone. Alan Rogers, uh, I'm the president of the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists, and I would just like to set the situation is that our legislation actually requires risk assessment, and you run the risk assessment against exposure standards, and those exposure standards are written into the legislation. Uh, as John has quite rightly said, uh, we've known each other for many, many <laughs> decades. Uh, the main problem is implementation and, uh, and, and, and trying to get people to measure exposure and go against an actual standard. And I'll be addressing that in my presentation later on. Um, some of you may be quite surprised to find that uh, the regulators in Australia are currently considering whether they remove exposure standards from mandatory exposure standards from the regulations. Your comments, please, John. Um, I, uh, you know, I think that uh, legislation has two purposes, in my view. One, it's, it's there to encourage people to do the right thing. So you know, in the UK, we introduced seatbelts many, many years ago. And you know, having the law actually stimulated people to use the seatbelts. It wasn't the fact that you know, you, you know, there was heavy enforcement of the law. It's in fact that the law set the tone for what people should do. So that's, that's one thing. I think it, it, it helps people see the right direction. But the other is that the law is there to uh, act as a way of uh, avoiding people being completely uh, irresponsible in what they do. So I, I think it's necessary to have some means of prosecuting people who do outrageous things. And so... You know, in the UK, uh, again, we've had circumstances where people have been put in a room with a, a, a rather nasty uh, vapour and been given a tube and told, put that in your mouth and we'll put the other end out the window and that will be okay. You know, and you know, the law is there to ensure that things like that don't happen. Uh, whether you need exposure limits to be able to enforce those kind of laws, I'm not sure. But you know, th that's the other perspective I have on legislation. But it won't, legislation on its own won't solve the problem of occupational cancer because it doesn't drive people in the right direction all the time and it doesn't force you to continuously improve. If I meet the limit, that's all I need to do.